Ron Dwyer Boss um, is somebody I've known for a while, and uh, I've watched from afar. He's like a, um, you know, like so many people in Sacramento, we have a lot of jewels in Sacramento, and no one knows that, that what they do. They're national figures in what they do, but they live here. And Ron is like one of the top dogs when you're talking about um, A, B, C, D. And uh, this is tonight is going to be just touching the touching it. But part of that, um, part of what it means to be a social justice uh, person is to engage with people, is to understand their issues. And I, I learned from Ron not to bring your suitcase to an issue, but bring yourself and listen. He says you got two ears and one mouth. And finding out what people need, what their needs are, is at the core of this. How many folks have heard of ABCD before? So it's, um, it, it really works like this exercise. It, in ABCD, it's a, it's a form of community development. I've been doing community development for about 30 years now. Um, that, that finds that the traditional way in which a lot of folks were taught either through social services or in planning school or things like that to, to enter communities was to ask what, what was wrong with them. And um, naturally, communities would respond the way you said you'd respond. It was negative. One, they give you a long list because everybody knows what's wrong. Um, and two, it's sort of a dampered um, conversation with less energy. Um, even when it starts with energy, it gets exhausting pretty quick because the lists get long. Um, and uh, it causes the conversation to be about um, what the other, the listener, can do for you, which is partly, I think, why institutions often ask, what's wrong? Because then if you tell me what's wrong, then I have a purpose. I can go fix it. Um, in asset-based community development, it sort of turns that on its head it says, let's listen for what's right. Every community has got gifts and strengths and talents. And asset-based community development is about finding those, identifying them, um, drawing them out so that the conversation has energy, so that you can build on what's there, um, and so that the community can do more for itself and not be as reliant on outside institutions. So we'll go in more detail on that in a minute, but um, that's the basics of asset-based community development. Just start, it's not so much positivity versus negativity um, as much as just making a conscious choice to when we enter a community to start with what's, a, what's already here that's good? What can I work with? Um, it's hard to work with what's wrong. There's not much you can do with a need. Mm, yeah, it's hard, not much you can do with a need. You can write a paper about it um, and you can definitely get grant funding for it, um, but you can't do anything with it. Whereas the assets of a community you can do a lot with. And we'll look into elements of that. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, let's go to the next slide. I think it's about six cuts through. Yeah, just keep going there all. I'm not so good at PowerPoint. And this one ended up with transitions in it. Um, one more. There you go. Um, because a lot of what I'm going to share with you tonight was brought to me from other people. I didn't invent anything. Um, I'm just really good at learning from other people and applying it. Um, so I started in this work in the late 80s on the south side of Chicago um, as a community organizer. Um, that was in the Pilsen neighborhood, which is primarily a Mexican-American neighborhood. Um, that's me with black hair. Just want to point out that it, if it did happen, it was true. Um, that's Mayor Daly, and that's 500 people who would come to a meeting to uh, get him to put more money into affordable housing in their neighborhood, to clean the streets, because that actually was an issue. Um, and to um, change the way the police worked in the neighborhood. It was one of the first community policing projects in the country. Um, we, it was actually a conversation back then that was not always agreed upon that police should get out of their car, not just when they were arresting somebody. Like, we had to have that argument. Um, so then, um, that was great, and Chicago was a great place to learn. I, and from there, I went to the west side of Chicago, which is primarily an African-American community, um, and organized there for a couple years. And, um, but then, you know, in Chicago, my wife and I had gotten used to how cold it got, but we never got used to how long it stayed cold. 
Mm. So on one snowy May day, at a literally snow delayed Cubs game, I just look and I'm like, we're not staying here. We gotta, we gotta go back to the West Coast. Um, so we came back to California. I ended up working with rural groups. Um, it's not by design, it was a job and I needed one. Um, and uh, so I worked with a group called Rural Community Assistance Corporation. They're headquartered in West Sacramento. They serve the entire Western US. And I learned all about uh, water systems and waste water systems and did a lot of farm worker housing. And so that's a, a wall raising at a community land trust um, that I got to help design um, the land trust, not the house. Um, that would be bad. Uh, and learn a lot about, uh, from, and from uh, native communities and farm worker communities especially, um, Native Hawaiian as well as American Indian communities. Um, travel got to be a lot. My kids were getting busier, so I wanted to stay home and kind of do some stuff in my own community. So I um, did two things. I um, went to work for Mutual Housing, so it was then Sacramento Mutual Housing. Um, uh, now it's Mutual Housing in California. We did multifamily housing around the Sacramento area, um, targeted for large families, because a lot of affordable housing couldn't handle large families. Uh, this was in Lemon Hill. Um, that was a great experience because I got to work with lots of different communities, especially in South Sacramento. We did a leadership training that was simultaneously translated in Hmong, Mien, and Spanish, um, and then mostly delivered in English um, with just a cross-section of, of folks who really did some amazing work. Um, I also, at that time, um, this is the first time I ever met Sam, I ran for the Natoma School Board, again, trying to dig more into my own, own community, and I went to watch how the school board functioned in my community, and, uh, and Sam was there advocating on behalf of a young man, and I, I, I was struck by what he had said, and I thought this was, um, was really good, and so followed him out to to say hi and, and hear more what was going on, and apparently the exist city school board panicked that Mr. Starks was getting a hearing with somebody who might be running. Um, so I spent eight years on the Thomas School Board, which was um, which was great. Um, it was a learning experience, and um, decided though that was enough. <laughs> That's a thankless job, school board, and. Um, <laughs> um, Everybody's like, Is it, you're building a political career. I'm like, if you want to build a political career, do not start with school board, right? You are the closest to people's most personal issues with no resources to do anything with them. Um, and uh, it's a great place to be. Just don't plan to go anywhere else with it because it pisses a lot of people off. Um, uh, but that's my community, Natomas, and I love it. Um, the um, what I do now. So what happened was. I realized that I loved community development. I was lucky enough to fall into a field that I loved early on and that was wide enough to handle my um, attention span. Um, but I couldn't find a job that um, would let me do my diversity of interests. And in so somebody just said, well, you should be a consultant because then you can do all these things you want to do, um, which is really terrible advice. But it worked out for me. And, um, so I started 11 years ago a firm called Pacific Community Solutions, and um, we, I do a few things. Um, we're a small firm. It's mostly me and a couple other people on the side. Um, but a big part of, of what I do is teach asset-based community development or work with groups who are trying to implement asset-based community development. I'm part of the ABCD Institute, which is, um, has historically been at Northwestern University. We just moved it to DePaul University, so that was a, a big deal. The founders are retired or retiring, so there's a, a board, um, and we're sort of trying to guide it into its next iteration. Um, but that, that work brings me a lot of joy, and I get to go around the world. Um, it's, it's an approach being used everywhere. Um, I do a lot of work with community groups about measuring impact. Um, you know, I started in community organizing. One of the things that's frustrated me over the years of kind of moving up into nonprofit management and being a funder for a bit is um, that we don't tell our story very well. We don't help communities tell their story very well. And there are ways to measure this stuff. Um, the, I would work with organizers who we'd ask, you know, tell us what you did with the money, or, or funders would hire me to help them say what they did with the money. And, and they would say the same thing that I actually reported on when I worked at Mutual Housing, which is, well, we had this many meetings and this many people showed up, and, yeah. right? 
So, which only proves you're good at using up people's weeknights. <laughs> That's the only thing that proves. There might be something else involved, but it just says you know how to use up people's time. Um, so I try to work with groups to help say what happened because of that. What change happened in the community? And what I like about that is not just helping people engage in community define their outcomes, but more so helping them work with the community to say, what story do you want to tell? Because mm -hmm. the funders will come and they'll say, we want you to evaluate this project and here's the things we want to see. And if you don't have the tools or the equipment or the, frankly, um, sort of critical literacy around evaluation from the community's point of view, then you're going to get stuck with answering their questions. And, and if you're answering their questions, then you're probably going to do the work the way they wanted you to do it, which may not have been what the community wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, this is really important empowerment work in that um, it builds communities' capacities to learn how to say the story they want to tell and measure the degree to which it's happening and define that for themselves. I also do a lot of coaching um, with, with boards um, nonprofit boards and um, and teams, uh, leadership teams and executives. So, which is to me sort of a small scale way to do asset based community development. What's cool is is it's the the same skills that I learned here. And early on, when I met these guys when I was in Chicago, um, work in all these in environments because there's there's some universality to how we engage with each other as community. So those are the the communities and the people that. Um, are really the authors of, of anything I have to say tonight, and I wanted to um, make sure that was there. Questions about that? Oh, yeah, my family. Um, <laughs> that's bad. Because so, they're like the main reason. That's my heart. Um, so I have a son and a daughter, and my son has a son. Um, and I love them, but, and I'm honest with them about this, I love him more. Um, right? Anybody grandparent in here? Yeah, right? It's great. Yeah, it's, it's piece of cake. Um, so he's four, and um, as I was getting a little bit tired in this work, uh, he came along, totally unexpected. My son was 19, um, and renewed my um, diligence for making sure that um, some paths are in place for his generation to have a, a world a lot of us are envisioning, but haven't got so far in accomplishing. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Um, so asset-based community development is rooted a lot in community organizing, which you guys have spent some time talking about. Right? Um, I like this wordle. It's from a report done by the Annie Case Foundation, uh, Annie Casey Foundation, on, uh, on resident engagement. They funded a pilot initiative and, and uh, hired a guy to write up sort of an evaluation of that initiative and all the different projects they funded. And it's really one of the best little mini pieces on community organizer out there. And I've got the, the reference for you in a couple slides. But so what I did is I took that entire text, <laughs> like 30 page, like half page document, and uh, threw it in a Wordle. I thought it was a really good demonstration of what community organizing is. I mean, it is ultimately about community. It took me a while to learn that, because um, I was there to organize. And I had issues I wanted to work on. and. Um, and then I got to Pilsen, and they wanted to work on trash and cops, which did not interest me at all. I got my degree in economic development and uh, housing and done this research on stuff, and they wanted to work on getting trash picked up and making police officers get out of their car. Um, mm -hmm. And my mentor reminded me that um, as a community organizer, your job is to help organize community. Mm -hmm. If they want to paint every house purple, and you help them figure out how to paint every house purple. Um, that you're offering a set of skills, not deciding what the outcomes are. So I was glad when this came up. And then, you know, a lot of it is about building organizations and building power. Um, go ahead to the next slide here. Uh, there's a long history, and I think it's just always important to remember anything we're doing now. Uh, the community organizing is rooted in the American tradition and American experience. And my favorite is Samuel Adams, not just because I like beer. Um, <laughs> he actually ruined that company. Um, the, the one we have now is named after one he, his father started and he wrecked. Because um, he was a terrible beer maker. Well, he's a terrible businessman, but he was a great community organizer. Do people know the story of Sam Adams? Mm -hmm. So um, there's a couple of biographies about him. About him. Um, he, he was in Boston at the time that, you know, there started to be some friction with the king. 
And at that point in time, everybody was just felt like we need to work it out with the king. And they wanted to stay a colony and stuff. And he said, well, you know, the problem is if it gets bad, he can shut down our legislature because the governor is appointed by the king and the governor calls the legislature or doesn't and literally owns the keys to the locks of the building. And if that happens, then we're just all lost. So we need to have a bunch of people out there who know what's going on. And so when they would meet, um, he would have the, the minutes of the meeting, the scribe <laughs> would write down <laughs> what they had talked about and what the issues were. That would get copied and sent out to all these communities outside of Austin, like Lexington and Concord and those places. And then he would go out there and organize what he called letter writing committees. And they would get the letter, talk about it, and write and send it. And they would organize letter writing committees. So there's all these places around Massachusetts that knew what was going on. So sure enough, when it did happen, that the king was like, I've had enough. Governor, shut the place down. You can't meet anymore. So he forbid them from meeting. Mm -hmm. See, I mean, Adam said, well, send the letters out. And organize all those letter writing committees to come in. So that's where the whole Paul Revere thing came in. His job was to carry letters out. So the, the whole light one, two light thing was, was uh, just built on that tradition. Um, people had heard about it all the way into Virginia and came up to learn how he organized letter writing campaigns, mm -hmm. um, which were really just small community groups in all these little towns who would know what was happening with the king, what the issues were, how it was affecting them, and decide what they wanted to do about that. And that's why they all had all the munitions and everything out there and were set up. So, Person who, and, and eventually convinced his peers that separating from the king was the only solution. Um, so I feel like it's really important. Um, so did her too, you know, for all the credit she gets for um, her women's suffrage, organized the first bus boycott in this country mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. So um, it was actually illegal to segregate on a, on a trolley car in Washington, D.C. during that time. Um, but that didn't stop the drivers from segregating the trolley car because that made them uncomfortable. And so she um, organized and put a stop to that um, early on. Mm -hmm. you, you know some of these stories of people who were, I mean, what I like, what's I think important about all these people is, is they weren't just speaking out for a cause. They were organizing things to get done. Mm -hmm. Right? So you imagine Harriet Tubman like on Facebook, let the slaves go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like some some you know, oh, that was a whole network. Where they had to figure out like which corners of the windows to put candles in on Fridays. Wow. It was a pretty intensive organizing effort. Uh, Dorothy Day. So that Saul Linsky gets a lot of press, um, especially after people freaked out that Obama had been a community organizer for a minute. Um, because he had been trained by one of the Alinsky. Are people familiar with Alinsky? No. Who's mm -hmm. radical? Right. So Saul so Alinsky sort of revived the community organizing tradition in the 40s. Um, he was a Jewish guy who had come to the University of Chicago to study um, <clears throat> juvenile delinquency. And he went to the back of the yards, which was a neighborhood where the um, cattle processing essentially was, um, and uh, um, Upton Sinclair's book, Mudbrick? No. Jungle. The Jungle, yeah, that was a book. The Jungle. The Jungle, was it? Mm -hmm. Upton Sinclair, but it was just awful conditions, um, because there was a lot of juvenile crime there. <laughs> Imagine that, awful conditions, poverty, labor abuse, there's juvenile crime. Mm -hmm. But what he found was that the conditions were were really contributing to this, and that it wasn't a matter of reforming young people, it was a matter of reforming conditions. And he um, started working with labor, and then also started working with the Catholic Church. It was a very Roman Catholic community. And those two were very opposed to each other at that time. In the middle of World War I, labor came out of socialism, which had communism attached to it, which you know negated religion, so the Catholic Church went the other way. So in the back of the yards, Alinsky figured out how to bring them together around their common interests because they all worked with common people. People who went to mass on Sunday, went to work on Monday and were part of the union. Mm. And so he convinced the leaders, like, you're the only people who see a separation here. The people who live here are part of you both. So you need to help figure out how to 
do things like um, you know five day week and have some safety conditions in place and get the city to be involved in some amount of environmental safety. Um, so he's considered kind of the godfather of modern organizing. Um, Alinsky was a phenomenal strategist. He's the one who um, went to visit uh, African American workers at Kodak in Rochester, New York, who were protesting about wage differences and a bunch of other discriminatory practices. And they figured out together um, to use the shareholder that, that they couldn't get into the shareholder meeting to talk to the board of directors about how the management was discriminating against them, so they bought shares. So they can get in the meeting mm -hmm. and then speak their right as a shareholder. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of strategy came up with. When, when um, the pastors in Rochester called Malcolm Max to say, would you come help us with our issue? He, he said, you don't need me. You, you know what I think about these issues. You need a strategist. You need to call Saul Linsky. Um, so, and then he got in jail a lot. <laughs> and in jail he wrote uh, a couple of books, one called Reveille for Radicals, another one called Rule for Radicals, um, that really defined what I would say is modern community organizing. The Industrial Areas Foundation was founded by him um, when some of his right-hand men, and this was all men back then, um, said, hey, you know, you're good at this, but we need to train other people how to do it. Um, so a guy named Ed Chambers helped him form that. Um, from that spun off uh, PICO, which is active here in Sacramento, Gamaliel, I think has tried to be active here in Sacramento, um, DART in the Southeast, which focuses on uh, women and people of color, um, and I'm missing one. Um, so a lot of the modern organizations, they're, they're definitely kind of tend to be issue-based. Uh, Alinsky used to say, he, he was known at the time as a, a rebel rouser because he would get people active. But then he would be interviewed on the news like in Rochester and he'd say, well, I didn't, I didn't create the tension here. You created the tension. I'm just coming in and helping to move it around. Um, uh, the, his, the, sort of his defining approach to organizing and, and where this has sort of started to inspire ABCD from moving a little bit to the side of us. He said, it's easy to get people involved. All you have to do is rub raw the sores of resentment. Mm -hmm. rub, about raw. That. rub raw the sores of resentment. So when something hurts us or cuts us, it hurts and we react. And then it scars over. And he's like, if you just rub that raw again, people will act again. Um, We'll talk about some limitations around that <laughs> a little bit tonight. Um, but it's true, it's just got some limitations. Obviously Malcolm X was a great organizer. He was a great organizer when he was, um, you know, before he got arrested um, mm -hmm. in terms of organizing numbers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the lotto, Malcolm X. Um, obviously Dr. King, mm -hmm. you guys have talked to people who are part of that, so you know that that was a, you know, it wasn't just an accident that Rosa Parks sat on the mm -hmm. bus. Yeah. Yeah. That was and Cesar Chavez here in California. What I like about Cesar Chavez, um, I, when I did the role work, I got to work with a lot of people who had worked with him. And uh, apparently he, they would call, so what happened is farm worker groups would have a issue, conflict with a work, uh, an employer, or around farm worker housing conditions, or field conditions, and um, they'd call him in, like, come help us, and get us going. And he would just come and sit down, and, um, set up in somebody's living room and then have people come in, usually a, a couple or a family, and ask them, what's going on? What do you want to do about it? And then the next people come in, what's going on? What do you want to do about it? And then at the end of the day, they would have a dinner and he would say, well, here's what I heard you said you all want to do about it. So he would basically figure out what they had in common that they might be able to take on and what they were each prepared to do and just weave that together for them. Um, mm -hmm. So he was a master at sort of bringing up their gifts. He also, um, as you can imagine, a farm worker barbecue, there was usually pork or other meats involved. Um, and it was notorious, and there's lots of pictures of, of people gathered around the table, and there's no food. It's because they had just found out he was vegetarian. And so somebody always had to run and get something. <laughs> so there's a lot of pictures of Sidney Chavez with people um, looking like they're going to eat, but there's no food. <coughs> Um, these folks, Gail Sincata, people are familiar with Gail Sincata? People are familiar with redlining? 
Yes. Okay. It's practice of drawing mm -hmm. around an area to say that's not a safe investment, which then getting the uh, right, which create an opportunity for unscrupulous real estate investors to right go to. Uh, they would do it kind of like gentrification is now. They would initially find an unsuspecting young black couple um, and find a good deal for them and get them into the neighborhood for cheap, kind of like artists now. And then they would go next door and say, the neighborhood's falling apart. Mm -hmm. Look what just moved in. Um, I will, your house is no longer worth, say if it had been 50,000, it's no longer worth that. It's probably worth about 10,000. I'll take it off your hands for 20 as a favor. And then this would happen. And then they would go find the next black couple and say, you know, they really don't want you in that neighborhood. Um, it's it's going to be hard, but for $100,000, I'll let you have this house. So um, redlining created blockbusting, which is what that was. Um, Gail Sincata was a middle-aged, overweight, chain-smoking white woman who wore a momo every day. Mm. And I got to work with her in Chicago, uh, but not at that time. At that time, she was watching her neighborhood get busted apart. And she didn't have any problem with African-American people. She didn't know many. They seemed nice, but this seemed wrong. And um, it's credited with getting the, the federal le redlining legislation done. She was minding her own business and then got busy and, and learned how all this worked and learned that banks and, and the federal uh, Housing Association or administration was behind the maps that created this. And um, out of her work came the NTIC, the National Training Information Center, which is still active on a number of housing issues because um, unfortunately that stuff's not all gone. Um, Ed Chambers was from Alinsky, from the IAF. Um, and then I think Obama for America in the, the 2000 or 2008 election um, tried to bring a lot of this stuff into the 21st century. Um, but it was the same techniques. It's the very same techniques. Get to know people, find out what they want, help them connect with other people who want the same thing. Mm. Right? Just connecting people. Um, a, B, C, D, go ahead, the next one I think was that, yeah. Um, sort of emerged out of in, in the 80s out of this, a couple of things were happening. One, organizing in the 60s and 70s had sort of become uh, only about left issues, because there was plenty of them, um, and they were awful. And so it captured a lot of attention. But some people started to figure out, this stuff transcends their moment in time issue, that this is about people connecting with each other, and it can happen at a local level. So a guy named Harry Boyd wrote a couple books. First one's called The Backyard Revolution. Um, understanding the new citizen movement. And uh, he got a hard time because a lot of uh, the original HOAs were inspired by this. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, we can, you know, and then it, like every good idea, you can turn it into a monster. Um, um, so he followed up with Community as Possible just to make sure that the clear point of this was, was democracy and citizenship. Um, and um, so it started to go a little bit more mainstream with this stuff. And organizers started to see that. You didn't necessarily need to take on the big issues. You could go into neighborhoods and people could organize around having a nice playground for their kids. Mm -hmm. That that was doable. And that actually might be the necessary first steps before they're ready to take on bank disinvestment or something like that. And so that sort of broke that field open. Um, and then uh, the two, my two mentors, John uh, McKnight and Jody Kretzman, were at Northwestern at the time and started to look around and say, what, as so we look at communities all over the country, what works? Let, let's go find out and ask people, what's working here and how, how is the community making it work um, in terms of, of grassroots community movement? And what they found was one, um, so this was early, this was the predecessor to the whole best practices. Let's find out the best practices. Mm -hmm. um, and they found that there wasn't one or two that they could just recommend, but they did find two common denominators um, behind all the stories they heard, whether they were urban or rural. Um, one was that they were starting with their assets. 
People were starting with what they had to work with and building off that. And the second was that somewhere in the story of that community's success, there had been an intentional effort to include traditionally excluded people. And in different communities, that meant different things. And some people, in some communities, that was going across the racial line. In other communities, it was youth. In other communities, it was uh, people with physical disabilities. But somehow, that process changed that group in a way that allowed them to really tap into the community's assets. So they put it together in a book called Building Communities from the Inside Out. It looks like a workbook. Northwestern said, we won't publish it. It's not academic enough. You need a, you need a name for this. They said, well, it's, called, it's Building Communities. No, that's a phrase. That's like regular English. This is <laughs> academics. We need a name. Um, so John McKnight likes to say that academics are built on the idea of taking something everyone knows, giving it a language nobody understands, and then telling you you have to get a degree yeah. to understand what everyone knows, <laughs> um, which those of you who have done your PhDs are experts in. Um, so they stuck with it, and this is still the best-selling book ever to be published at Northwestern. Um, it was just the idea that communities can build themselves from inside out. They do not need external ex institutions to um, come in and fix them. Mm. Um, that sometimes external institutions can be helpful, but not when we start there. That they're better to be supplemental. Um, this uh, was well received and also controversial. Um, they sort of challenged the Alinsky idea that, that you just motivate people by pissing them off again that there's some motivations to act that come in people's desire to use their gifts mm -hmm. or their desire to pursue their dreams or their passions. Um, Mike Green and the late Henry Moore, my other mentors, um, came out with this book, When People Care Enough to Act, which sort of wove together organizing um, and asset-based community development. Because a lot of asset-based community development sort of came about making a list of assets and just, it got a little, kind of happy positivity. <laughs> and so Mike and Henry We're great at everything. Huh? We're great at everything. Yeah, and then it's all okay. And so they sort of put together, there's an organizing tool here um, that if you, if you help lift up all the assets of a community, you can help them um, use those to make the changes they want to make. Um, so those are, and then there's, uh, if you go one more, there's a couple other books I just want you to be aware of that I think are really helpful in this work. Um, <laughs> people heard of Peter Block? <laughs> huh? Peter Block. Mm -hmm. uh, Community, the Structure of Belonging. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my most tattered book. I should probably say the Bible a bit. Um. <laughs> you guys got these, some of these down? Yeah. Okay. You know, um, you can take this and then send it out to everybody. Is that okay? Just yeah. Oh. Um, oh. But yeah, it's just, um, a great way of thinking about how to bring people together so that they're accountable to each other, they're responsible for each other, um, and that they are engaging on their gifts in a, in a really deep way. Um, Peter's amazing, he's kind of grumpy now, he's getting older, and, um, uh, and we won't get to see him out here anymore. He won't fly anymore unless it's to see family. So he's done with, he won't do any work that he can't drive to and drive home now. He was a management guru for a long time and made a ton of money helping big companies try to figure this stuff out. And he got tired of going back every five years to the same company to do the same thing. <laughs> and then about 10 years ago, he's like, forget it, I'm just doing community now. Um, and he put this together, and I still think it's his best book. This is the Annie Casey book I was telling you about, um, Reflections on Community Organizing and Resident Engagement. So it is in a context of them funding something called the Rebuilding Communities Initiative. Um, but it's, I think, a great description of, of how community work happens. Um, and then this, for those of you who are, like, who are working in uh, companies, whether they're nonprofits or private sector companies, I think it's one of the best books that sort of bridges this stuff. Um, it's called The Spider and the Starfish. Anybody familiar with that book? Mm -hmm. um, they basically went through and um, looked at a number of models, sort of old models, of organizing companies, and this applies to communities too, around uh, a spider model. So you have a strong center, and this is another critique of the Linsky model, it was all based on an organization. 
Um, so if you weren't part of that organization, didn't connect well in your community, you, you didn't get to be part of it. Um, problem with spiders, if you kill the head, spider's done, right? Um, they looked at sort of starfish model, um, an emerging model of corporations coming out of Silicon Valley, but a lot of places, so Craigslist, Napster, remember Napster? Yeah. Yeah. Um, whole chapter on Napster. Um, but they trace it back also, the same kind of model, to the Apache chiefs, who the Mexican and U.S. government had so much trouble getting rid of because they didn't have a centralized model. Um, so a starfish, if you cut the leg off a starfish, what happens? It goes yeah. What happens to the leg you cut off? It grows a starfish. Yeah. Yeah, you get two. You get two. Because every part of a starfish has what it needs to sustain and reproduce. Wow. So their point, these are management guys, their point is that companies that learn how to decentralize power will survive our coming tumultuous times and rapid change and all that kind of stuff because it's not just all dependent on you know the president, vice president, CEO figuring this stuff out. But it's so true for communities too. Okay? If we're just waiting on the city to do everything, and then 2009 happens, we don't know how to get anything done. So in my next door, people are complaining there's some broken glass in front of the people's house, and they haven't picked it up. So where, who do I call in the city? I'm like, just get a, I just got a broom. And I walked down a block. Well, OK, I drove and pulled over and swept. Like, we don't need to call the city to pick up broken glass. Yeah, the guy who's it's in front of his house should have done it. But he's drunk most of the time anyway. So you know, just do it. So if this is your community, what is the impact of, of living with this description of you on a regular basis? OK, people get depressed. I am just like you're doing too. Yeah, you it feels a little hopeless. It, you it can easily, yeah, yeah, it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. You so want to try and get out. You want to leave. <laughs> you you want to leave. I'm trying to stay there. Well, this is where our school districts are. That's what you did. I mean, you know. Right, school whole, districts describe their neighborhoods this way and say, yeah. this is what we're trying to serve, and therefore we can't teach kids. Um, this creates a lot of problems. So if there's one thing I want you to get out tonight, this is what comes out when you do a needs assessment. Who's ever been part of a needs assessment? Here's the um, things we've seen as the consequences of needs maps. Um, the first is that people in those communities start to feel deficient. Mm -hmm. And they will talk about having a, a, a prison around them that follows them wherever they go. So they, on the west side, they would talk about going down to the loop where they work. Where do you live? They would say where they live, and all of a sudden people made all kinds of assumptions about them. They were deficiency-based. But people start to believe it, too. Um, this is the one that I think is most damaging. Local relationships are damaged. Go back to that first slide. If this is your community, do you want to know your neighbor? No. So communities that buy into this label, which is easy to do when you're being told it over and over and over, <coughs> stop relating to each other. So a lot of my job when I came into communities like this was just getting helping people get to know each other. And the way it, it manifests on the west side of Chicago is you had these beautiful buildings, kind of like we have midtown walk-ups. You know, you see them in movies and stuff too. Porches and uh, on a, in West Garfield Park, nobody was on those porches or on those stairs. There was bars on the windows. Kids were told they had to play out back. So now. Think about it, you have a relatively lower income community that also happens to be next to a number of freeway on-ramps and off-ramps heading to the suburbs, and there's whole streets with no eyes on them. <coughs> what business endeavor might do well in that context? <laughs> Drugs. Right? Um, you get people, suburbanites leave in the loop where they work at their offices, swing through, get the drugs, leave, nobody's watching, and then that reinforces things, right? Like, oh, there's drug deals. I don't want my kids to be out front. I got to have bars in the windows. So I was working with a group of women who had gone through a process of learning how to run their own home daycare business. 
So they had been identified through an ABCD process as people who were good at taking care of kids and probably had some aptitude for business and wanted to do that. And, and the agency I was working for thought that, well, that's a good economic development. Instead of having all this child care money pour into kinder care downtown, let's see if we can recapture it in the neighborhood and have that go to a neighbor. So if one, they were almost all women, if one woman has a daycare business with eight kids, well, that's eight moms and dads who can put their money there, leave their kid in their neighborhood, go to work, come back. So it's a pretty cool project, except that it's kind of hard to get a daycare business going when there's drug dealers on the corner. That's bad for daycare business. Um, so their task was like, how do they want to get rid of that? And one of the things we did was we just started um, a front porch campaign. Got people to agree to sit out on the front porch. It was like a half hour on Tuesday. It was so hard to get people to agree to this because they were afraid they'd get shot. Or we, we eased into it over some time. But eventually what people found was, that guy goes to my church. Kids would recognize kids from the street from their school. Nobody knew this stuff about each other because everybody just came home and, and went in the back. And if you're lucky, you had one of these garages that was in the back by the alley. So then you never even had to see anybody. Um, those, those damaged relationships weren't the fault of the people who lived there. They're the fault of all the agencies who had done needs assessments over and over and over and told them, you don't want to know your neighbors by telling them this community is filled with crime and unemployment and dropouts. Um, all those things were there, but a bunch of other stuff was there too. And whole streets went from vacant in terms of what was out there to barbecues and um, um, people connected in a number of different levels. So it's, it's one of the things I really recommend people never, if you're going to do community engagement stuff, never do a needs assessment. It's, um, I know you got to at CPC to allocate funds and stuff, but um, the different, uh, clearly use the example, if you start with people and say, what do you want for your community? That's not a needs assessment. Most needs assessments start with, what do you need? And usually the implication is, and who can we go find to get it for you? Which is a really bad message to a community means you are, in, you are incapable of getting anything without somebody else. Mm -hmm. You are powerless. And we're going to reinforce that by asking you, what don't you have that we can have somebody else get? Now asking you, <coughs> what do you want? That's different. Because then the next question a good organizer asks is, what are you willing to do to get it? Mm -hmm. Who here knows something about that? When did this community have that? What was that like? Who was part of that? Those are asset questions. Um, the other thing that starts happening with needs assessments is money just comes in for narrow programs and then all the social service providers start having meetings because they're siloed and they're frustrated they're siloed. But they got siloed in the first place because we figured out the funding based on needs assessments um, and not based on community goals overall. Um, these, uh, Mark alluded to this, uh, needs-based maps of communities magnify leaders who um, magnify those deficiencies. So people who spend a lot of time building their sort of political or religious or community leadership credentials based on pointing out what's wrong. Mm. Right. You've seen this before? Poverty mm -hmm. pimps. Poverty pimps. Um, <laughs> President Trump did that, right? His whole campaign was based on that. Highly high in deficiencies. Um, does very little to empower a community to take control of itself. Um, go ahead, the next one. Okay. What happens, Ron, when my powerlessness is someone else's bottom line? Mm, I can't give them a reason for existence. Um, financial, political? A lot of financial okay. and political if you're right. talking politics, but I think of, you know, Shar would talk to me about sometimes the, um, the, uh, the textbook companies sometimes. Right, benefit from, yeah. yeah. Um, then you need, it's important to know that so that when you start to gain your power back, you know you're going to have to use it to fight somebody right away. Mm. Right away, right. I'm almost in the almost in the uh, the needs assessment. 
Almost right. as if they want the needs assessment right. because they know that the next very next thing is going to. Right. They they have the. Um. I didn't mean to. Um. I. So, uh, both public housing, um, major public housing projects in Sacramento, um, right over here, two, two rivers, and then um, off Broadway, Elder Grove, had um, promise zone projects, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. to plan for that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, it's a pretty effective program, but um, it's, it's got some flaws. And one of them is that to apply for promise zone funding, or once you get planning funding, you have to do a needs assessment. And, and HUD, in its effort to listen to President Obama at the time, who said, you've got to know what the community wants, said, OK, we'll make sure that as part of this funding, the, the public housing agency, or like the Mercy Housing, or whoever is getting the contract, will have to uh, survey 85% of the community. So that's pretty high. Yeah. Like that's, you don't even do that. You don't even need to do that statistically. It's significant. But, they said 85%. And then here's the survey. So it's all sounding good until you open the survey. And the survey is all about what's wrong with you. And I kid you not. It it's comes up, and let me see if I can say your name right. Jaron? Jaron. So I would, I would knock on the door and dry answer, and I start asking the questions. It's like a 45 minute to hour and a half survey. Um, uh, and, and the more you got wrong with you, the longer it's going to go. So we're just going to spend time on that. <laughs> Um, but if I ask you uh, whether or not you graduated from high school and you say no, I've got two pages of questions to ask about why that was. If you say yes, I just move on. It doesn't say what contributed to your success. Did you go to college? How, like, it doesn't tap into why you were successful. It mo it's like not even interested. So when I've been a consultant on a few of these projects, when I push back, like, can we ask about what contributed to success? Because that's where we'll find the gifts of this person who might be able to contribute to the community. And yeah. why do we need to know all the terrible things he did? That, like, is it going to be news that he took drugs and didn't graduate from high school? Is that like a connection we haven't made yet? Um, or that he had to take care of younger siblings? There's any number of reasons, and we know what they all are. Why do we have to make him listen, answer questions about them for the next 25 minutes? Um, they said, because that's how we know where to put the funding. I don't think so. I think actually if he had graduated from high school and had some success stories, we could put money into him to teach others. But the agencies who are lined up waiting to get the rest of the planning grant did not think that. They, oh, ha they have programs for oh. fixing the high school dropouts mm -hmm. and they need to know how many of them there are so they know how much programming to do. The ABCD approach is partly about listening, but then partly about asking certain questions. So I could have listened to you talk about what you weren't good at doing and what your heart wasn't in. Um, but I specifically asked you and focused you entirely on what you were good at. Mm -hmm. Because we all need training in that. It is not our natural go-to place in this Western culture um, and in a lot of other cultures too. And it's certainly not the go-to place in sort of the community development social service sector. But the reality is that everyone has something to offer, and it turns out it's transformational to invite people to offer their gifts. Yeah. Mm. That will create more power than five workshops on how to run a meeting. Yes. Now eventually, people gotta know how to run a meeting. <laughs> yeah. Right, or it's just chaos. But they will figure that out, and they will say, you know, we need some help running this meeting. We'll go get you somebody. But if you're teaching people how to run a meeting, when you haven't asked them, what do you have to offer, right. um, you're, it's just a very short-term thing. And somebody in three years from now is going to be teaching them how to run a Asking people about when things are or were at their best, what was happening, and what about that do you want to carry forward? And then what do you have to contribute what to that? What do you that? have to contribute? It's such an important piece. Um, so those are huge. Want to um, go one more? This is an asset map. Yeah. So what's cool about asset maps is they're more positive, they're more hopeful, they give us something to work with, and you can make them prettier. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Um, go to the next one. There's another. Here's a group did this one. Um, 
where they organize the assets of individuals and then associations and then organizations. 915 the area. guys, time person, 915. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Be done, Organizing a meeting, okay. right? Uh, <laughs> so, okay. okay. right. so here's the trick, is we know that 90% of any community's assets will fall in one or more of these categories. So if we're intentional about looking in these areas, we will find them. McKnight always says, you can't find what you're not looking for. Mm. So if we ask people, what are your talents and skills? Either through a hands head heart or from when any of the many uh, gift assessment forms in that green book, we find out things. If we say, what's in your community? Where associations are. Associations are a really powerful part of ABCD because um, Associations, by that we mean voluntary groups. So nobody's making them go. So people are voluntarily associating with each other around a common interest. You guys are essentially association. They're powerful, because that's where people already are. Organizers are always telling me, like, I can't get any kind of my meetings. I'm like, well, because nobody cares about your meetings. <laughs> it doesn't mean they don't care. Like, I, I used to do trainings for the PTA. They don't invite me back anymore. Um, because what's the biggest problem PTAs talk about? Nobody comes to meetings. Look, few people do all the work. And I would say it's not that people, and then, and then you ask them, why don't people come? They go, well, they don't care. That's not true. That's not true. I've never met a parent who doesn't care. I've, I've met parents who care badly, right? But people care. In ABC, we say apathy is just a sign of bad listening. Apathy is just a sign of bad listening. People care. We just need to find out what they care about and connect it to what we're working on. People already, they go to church, they go to a book club, they walk with friends around the track. I worked with a guy, worked for Habitat for Humanity in Orange County in Fullerton, California, the Wood Creek Park, which was infested with gangs and drug deals. Mm. and. Um, and he was just brand new to this, and he's like, I don't know what to do, but I need to work on my Spanish, and there's these five moms who, who walk there every day, so I'll just walk with them and work on my Spanish. That group of moms has transformed that entire neighborhood. That park is awesome now, that school is awesome. He started with what they already cared about, which was being together and talking. And then they built from that association. So association is really powerful because they amplify the gifts of individuals. Um, Institutions are also groups of people, but they're organized to produce the same outcome every time. So an association can do what it wants. Like a book club, you don't actually have to read the book, right? And then you can decide what book or not to read a book or to have a barbecue. There's nobody, you do what you want. Institutions, you know, you show up uh, to teach school and you've got to teach school. And if you don't, you eventually fire you and put you in play, you know, because that's what they do. Um, is they teach school. So that's, that's an important part of community's assets because it brings a lot of resources and talents in a community. Um, not a lot of flexibility here, but a lot of strengths. A lot of flexibility here. Um, every community has physical assets. You got a vacant lot, you got an asset. Economic assets, so productive work that people do. And culture and stories is an important one. Asking people, what's the, the history of this place? What are the cultures? What are the stories? When does this community come together? When does it overcome something? Um, the basic practice of ABCD in a community is, is getting folks together in a church hall, or I did it actually in a machine shop one time. That was unique in Columbus, Ohio. Um, sticking things on the wall was interesting. Um, you're just sticking them to saws and drill bits and stuff. But we would have people um, divide into little groups of five or six write down all the associations they could think of, give them like five minutes, rotate, then they go, next group would go to associations, they go to institutions, right? Within half an hour, you had 60 people in a community that commits it had nothing going for it at all, and its main problem was it didn't have a seat at the city's table, at, the, at its neighborhood uh, convening, go, wow, we've got a lot going on. Mm -hmm. There's a lot we can do here. Just that very process, gave them some power, because mm -hmm. it recognized what they had to offer. They developed two or three projects, 
out of that that they want to work on that they can get done based on those assets. No outsiders needed. And they started changing the way the neighborhood worked and the way they worked. And the other thing we asked them to do was to stop asking for a seat at the city's table. Make your own table. Make your own table with your own seats. Mm. Eventually they will come. Yeah. Has anybody ever seen a success that p political people were not wanting to be near? <laughs> <laughs> I had these kids over in West Sacramento fix up in uh, front of a senior center. And uh, like a day, you know, people drop in and play games and stuff. And the local blogger took a picture of it, wrote a little article, a little ribbon cutting. And uh, the mayor, uh, or one of the council members, called the parks commissioner or district director to say, why weren't we invited to the ribbon cutting of the senior center? He said, we have a ribbon cutting of the senior center. Like, well, somebody had a ribbon cutting the senior center that belongs to the city. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, then the city trouble. got really interested. And long story short, another ribbon cutting. They um, <laughs> redid the way they planned parks in West Sacramento, oh. where they had youth and people who lived near those parks very involved in designing and the parks and running things at them. Just part of ABC is not trying to get at other people's tables, not trying to get a seat at their table. Just making your own table making it successful, and they will ask. And sure enough, in Columbus, Ohio, um, the mayor eventually sent somebody out to say, can we be part of this? Mm -hmm. And that's when they said, sure, as long as we have a seat at that table, too. We'll trade you seats. See how much power difference there is in that, mm -hmm. than begging for a seat? To say, we'll give you one of ours. So it's hard and long work, mm -hmm. but it's, it's work that builds power mm -hmm. in a way that, um, you know, Frederick Douglass used to talk about the power of reading is you can't unlearn it. And I think I feel like ABCD is that to community organizing. It's once people discover their assets and the power they have, they can't unlearn that. And then you can start doing the other stuff about changing a city policy or things like that. Um, but you'll never undo the connections that get made in a community and the relationships that get built. A lot of this is organizing by question because it, it, it keeps the space that people fill their own as opposed to me coming in with a program where the space is filled by my program. It doesn't mean that there's not programs and stuff that get involved in this. Um, it just means that we start, if, if we don't start with people's own power, latent, and a community's power, latent and active, um, we will never come back to it. Then what happens is the, the power of the other interests take over, whether they be political interests um, or financial interests, and then we spent a lot of time having this fight over here when we left the foundation behind. Mm -hmm. You weren't afraid of failing, what would it look like? I wrote it down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because I, that's what I need. Like that's what I, that's what and, I need uh, to ask myself. If you knew it was going to work, what would your next step be? Um, in 10 seconds, here, you guys are going to get this slideshow. Sam's going to send it to everybody. Or whoever owns that computer is going to send it to everybody. Um, this is a, a sample community asset map of the kinds of things you see in asset maps. So I'll give you an example. Go ahead. Um, this contrasts this community building model with sort of traditional service models. Uh, this is just how the paradigm shifts. And this is the example of young people. Um, he's good at art. She's a potential leader. He's great at, at getting people to smile. Like, we could just do that, too. Um, it's just a shift. It's just saying we're going to focus over here. It doesn't mean that we don't know this stuff is true, too. Anybody who works with young people knows you've got to provide some structure and some encouragement and all this kind of stuff. But if we focus here, we'll get further. Go ahead. Um, the ABCD sort of progression is to help people in communities move towards being the producer of their own outcomes. And even when they're using outside resources, being the driver of those resources. Mm versus the recipient. Uh, it's, sometimes it's an advocacy issue. Sometimes the only way they can get into the game is being an advisor. Um, a lot of times we just are recipients of things, but we're trying to get people here. I think that's, oh, and there's a number of sort of guiding principles. Um, we're motivated by what we don't have, to use what we do have, to get what we want. Um, but Go back in a second and go there. Um, always start with a question. There's 
never been any to solve the problem. And the, this is called the iron rule of organizing, meaning you can't break it or you're not organizing. Never do for anyone what they can do for themselves. You're mm -hmm. taking their power away. Mm -hmm. The second you do that for somebody else, you take their power away. Mm. It is depowerment. Mm. Um, the, the middle and southern parts of this country are filled with councils or neighborhood associations or um, oh, what's, I can't remember, in North Carolina they have a particular name, but basically, People organized for rights and to be heard. And in the 60s and 70s, all these neighborhood councils rose up. Um, and it, for a lot of African Americans in the South, that was the first place they had voice about their community. And they were great. Um, they are still run by the same people. I mean, literally the same people. So they're like 60 or 70, 80. I had a woman who started the Black Panther chapter in Norfolk, Virginia, tell me she was afraid to talk to anyone under 25 in her neighborhood. You were under 25 in Norfolk? Right. So, those are places trying to figure out, do they die, like do they just stop? But this is great tradition. And they are trying to get some stuff done in the neighborhood, like how do they morph to bring young people in and to let young people be in charge, like they were, in the 70s, um, it, it's already happened, right? They morphed from a fairly powerful group of councilors. There's a lot of cities that have them in their charter even now. Like they, they give money to these, they're officially recognized. The, the city has to have a neighborhood council president's convening. Chattanooga, Tennessee has this. And, and then in some of the neighborhoods that the neighborhood council involves like three people. That's it because nobody wants to be part of that thing because they know how to run a Robert's Rule of Order meeting that nobody wants to be part of. Um, <laughs> so they've already morphed into something other than what they were. Um, it's whether we're conscious about it and saying, is there a way we could morph into something that's um, of value? Mm -hmm. And for most of the groups I work with, I, I just, I tell them the same thing. I mean, it, it seems like um, a lazy answer, but it's true, go out and listen to people. Mm. Yeah. Talk to them, meet, and I, you know, we can do some math, and really quickly, I can tell you how five people can have 60 conversations in a month, and then bring all those folks together and identify common interests, and stuff will happen. But if you're an existing group that's kind of wound down, you have to be ready to release the power you have over your little thing to the people who might help create the new big thing. And that's hard for some folks. 